Uh, good afternoon. This is Anthony Ania. I am uh, very pleasure, happy to be able to be with you today and to talk to you a little bit about what needs to be done to protect assets from the cost of long-term care. So for most seniors, uh, I would say the vast majority of seniors, the major problem that they're going to face as they age is not estate taxes. There are, of course, seniors that are worried about estate taxes, and those would be your affluent seniors, individuals that have anywhere from six to $20 million in assets. But that really only comprises a very small portion of the population of seniors in this country. Uh, probably less than 1% of individuals have an estate that will ever have to file either a New York or federal estate tax return. The big concern for most seniors is the cost of long-term care. What happens if you get sick and you need either care at home or you need care in the nursing home? Do you have the means to finance that care yourself without significantly depleting the assets and life savings that you have? Uh, and also making sure that there is enough money to take care of your spouse if something happens to you? Or do you have long-term care insurance that will be able to cover the expense? And if you don't have significant assets and you don't have long-term care insurance, then what steps have you taken to protect your assets? What have you done in terms of asset preservation planning and long-term care planning? Have you done anything to shelter and protect the assets from the cost of long-term care? So why is this important? Well, it's important because in New York, it is not relatively easy to become eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid is what's called a means-tested entitlement program. It's not Medicare, and you don't get Medicaid just because you turned age 65. In order to get Medicaid, you have to be 65 or older, or disabled or blind, and or, or, or be an individual that meets the test for Medicaid eligibility, the financial test. So the financial test is very limiting. In order to get Medicaid, you cannot have more than $15,750 of what's called available resources. So if you have more than $15,750 and it's all non-IRA money, then technically you're not eligible for Medicaid, either home care or nursing home. So because of this limitation and restriction on the amount of resources one can have, and also the income restriction, because the income restriction is that you're not allowed to have more than $895 a month to be eligible for Medicaid. Now, if you're applying for Medicaid home care, there is a way of protecting uh, that, medic, that income that's above the 895. And the way it's normally done is by utilizing what's called a pooled community trust. But before we get into that, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, Medicaid nursing home and Medicaid home care. Obviously, nursing home is self-explanatory. If, for example, you need to reside at a nursing home and you have assets, you have a house and you have non-IRA savings, well, the house does not affect your eligibility for Medicaid. However, your house is an asset if it's in your name alone against which Medicaid could have a claim. So being able to take steps while you're in good health and don't need Medicaid to protect your assets is very important. Uh, additionally, uh, if you have savings and they're non-IRA savings, uh, Medicaid views IRA and 401k savings differently then they view your regular savings, or your checking account, your brokerage account, your savings account. All those assets that are non-IRA, if they're more than 15750 if you're single, disqualify you for Medicaid. If you're married and your one spouse is going into the nursing home, the other spouse can have in New York up to about $123,000 of resources without disqualifying you for Medicaid. If they have more than that, then they may need to file spousal refusal. They may need to say to Medicaid, I refuse to use my assets and my income to support my spouse 
don't look at what I have, only look at what my spouse has for purposes of eligibility. So again, Medicaid home care is where you're at home and you need assistance with long-term care. You need assistance with activities of daily living, uh, walking, dressing, feeding, bathing, toileting, and you want Medicaid to provide you with the aid to come into your home and to provide that care for you. So there's a very popular program in New York. It's undergoing a major change in terms of eligibility. Uh, we were told that if you gave away money after October 1st of 2020, you would be creating a 30 month look back and possibly up to a 30 month penalty period. That date now has been pushed back by the Department of Health. It looks like they're only going to look at transfers uh, that create the 30 month look back if they're done after April 1st. So right now it looks like the new date for this penalty and look back period to be imposed for Medicaid home care is April 1st of 2021. But knowing that you have these restrictions with regarding Medicaid eligibility and that the amount of assets that you can have are limited, what can seniors do? And this is where the Medicaid proactive planning comes into place. These are the steps that you take, not when you're in need of Medicaid home care and nursing home, but before you're in need of them. And what can you do? Well, obviously you can go out and buy long-term care insurance. A lot of individuals have done that, uh, but generally they don't wait to be in their 70s to buy long-term care insurance. It's something you normally purchase when you're in your 50s, maybe even early 60s, and are in good health and you're insurable. And again, you buy an amount of insurance that's gonna cover your care either at home or in a nursing home. It could be a per diem amount, like $250 a day for five years, or it could be a lump sum that's available for your care. It also could be in a per diem amount that's available for your lifetime. Uh, the amount of premiums you're going to pay depends on how much insurance you get how much coverage you receive, and also your health, your insurability. Will the policy be rated or not if you're in poor health? So it's something that you really wanna look into when you're younger and you're in relatively good health because the premiums will be lower. And generally the premiums on long-term care insurance are locked in. So if you buy a policy, they're generally locked in unless the insurance company can get an increase from the state insurance department for the entire class of individuals that they insured. It's happening more and more now, but there are options that you can select to kind of reduce the increase in the premium because it's not unusual to see a 20 or 30% increase in the premium. If you're in the market for long-term care insurance, you may also wanna consider buying a policy that's a hybrid, that's a combination of long-term care insurance and life insurance. And those are very popular because at the end of the day, if you've bought straight long-term care insurance and you never use the benefits under the policy, then the money you've spent is gone. It's, it's, it's wasted in a sense. But if you have the hybrid and you don't use the long-term care policy and then you die, obviously there's a death benefit associated with that policy. So it's a much more valuable kind of you know, policy to have. There are definite benefits from the policy, whereas with a straight long-term care insurance policy, it, it all depends on, you know, when you apply for the insurance and to make the, you know, to make the insurance active and how long you're going to use the benefits for. So let's say, for example, you've been paying since you were 60 years of age on the policy and now you're 85 and you make an application for insurance benefits for home care but you only live for one year, well, that's what you got out of the, the policy, that one year worth of coverage. Whereas if it's a combination of the life insurance and the long-term care insurance, uh, there probably your family will see a recoupment of some of those monies that you paid into the policy. Whereas here, they may see very little recoupment of what was paid. What else can you do? Obviously getting assets out of your name, transferring and conveying assets, making what Medicaid calls an uncompensated transfer of assets is very important for purposes 
of protecting assets for long-term care purposes. When you take assets out of your name and you're making a gift, and the gift is for long-term care planning purposes, Medicaid planning, it is what's called an uncompensated transfer of assets. It's a gift. Whenever you make an uncompensated transfer, you are creating the five-year look-back period for nursing home Medicaid. And after April 1st year of 2021, you're going to be creating the 30-month look-back period for Medicaid home care. So making a conveyance of assets, getting assets out of your name is good because now you've started the clock running. As long as you hold on to your house and your non-IRA savings, you're never starting the clock running. You're not getting assets out of your name and beginning the process of protecting those assets by starting the clock running. So what can you do? Obviously you can make an outright gift of assets. You could give money to your children or grandchildren and that will begin the clock running. You'll get the clock running for purposes of Medicaid eligibility. But a lot of seniors don't like to make an outright conveyance of assets. They're concerned about doing it. They worry about, you know, what happens if I give my child or my grandchild the money outright and they go off and spend the money or they waste the money or they get divorced or they get sued or they filed for bankruptcy. So there's a lot of concerns with making outright conveyances of assets. So most seniors are reluctant to do it. The most common way of making this conveyance that creates the five-year look-back period or the 30-month look-back period is by transferring assets to what's called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. This trust is an irrevocable trust. It's not revocable or revocable, it's irrevocable. You can be the creator of the trust, but you cannot be the trustee and neither can your spouse. You also cannot get back from the trustees what you put into the trust. There is no invasion of principle for your benefit. However, if you put your house in the trust, you have the right to live in the house for the rest of your life. Nobody can sell it or rent it without your permission. You pay all your bills just like you're paying them now. If, for example, you're getting the STAR exemption or a senior citizens or veterans exemption, you continue to get all those tax exemptions. The reason being is that this trust is known as a defective grantor trust. For income tax purposes, you are the owner of the assets in the trust. So if you put a savings account in the trust and that savings account generates income or dividends and interest, if you're getting that money and you can receive the income from the trust, however, if the trust says you must get the income, then Medicaid will count the income as part of your available income. If the trust says the income payable to you at the discretion of the trustees, then if you don't need the income, or if you're applying for Medicaid, your trustees can stop paying the income to you. Because the trust is what's known as a defective grantor trust, you are the owner of the assets for income tax purposes. So the assets are taxable to you and you get all the tax benefits that you would otherwise get if you own the property. The star exemption, the veterans, the senior citizens, and more importantly, if the house is sold, you still get the personal residence exclusion. So therefore, if the house is sold during your lifetime, the creator of the trust, you can exclude 250,000 from capital gains if you're single, $500,000 from capital gains if you're married. So it gives you all the advantages of owning the assets, except you don't own them. And you do have a couple of additional powers that give you a sense of comfort that the assets cannot be wasted or dissipated. Number one, you have the right to change who the trustees are. So let's say you pick two of your children and you're unhappy with what they're doing, you can remove or change them as trustees. Additionally, you have reserved in the trust something called a limited power of appointment. This gives you the power to change your mind as to who the ultimate beneficiaries of the trust are. So in a sense, if your kids are not behaving well or they're doing something contrary to your wishes, you can remove them as the trustees and you can also change your mind 
as to their being a beneficiary of the trust. Another major advantage of this trust is, is that when you die, the assets in the trust are taxable and includable in your taxable estate at its fair market value on date of death. What does that mean? That means your children will receive the assets in the trust at fair market value on date of death, and they will not pay capital gains tax unless they sell the property for more than fair market value on date of death. A very valuable tool, especially when you're putting your house and appreciated stock into the name of this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Additionally, another major advantage is that when you die, there is no probate. So let's say for argument purposes, you've transferred to the trust your house and savings, non-IRA, that you want to protect, but you wanted to keep control over your other savings. Well, maybe what you would do is you would have an irrevocable trust, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, for your house and the savings you want to protect. You're going to have a revocable trust for the assets that you want to keep control over, not your IRA. And then you could have the IRA, which has named beneficiaries. If you died and you had your assets in a irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, a revocable trust, and an IRA or 401k that has named beneficiaries and named alternate beneficiaries, you are going to die without any probate assets and your family will not have to go through the time consuming and expensive probate process. And more importantly is because you didn't have any probate assets, if you received Medicaid benefits, there's nowhere for Medicaid to go file their claim or lien because in New York, Medicaid only has liens or claims on probate assets. So as you can see, doing asset protection planning can be very valuable. It really doesn't make a difference when you do it, but the sooner you do it, the better you do it. Obviously, if you're going to do planning and you do it when you're in your late 60s or early 70s or mid 70s, well, that's better than doing it when you're 85 because there's a greater chance if you're in your 80s that you may, may need long-term care before the five-year look back expires. But even if the five-year look back is a concern for you, there are still advantages to doing the trust. Additionally, if we ever really needed to get the assets out of the trust, there are, are ways of doing that as well. So there is a provision that we have in the trust that allows the trustees to invade the assets, assume the trustees are your children, for their siblings as well. So there is a, there is a way of getting the assets out of the irrevocable trust during your lifetime if we need them for you or for any other reason. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about planning for your, your, your later years. You know, a lot of people just do a last will and testament, and it's really not enough. You really need to look at, excess, at, at doing long-term care planning and what steps you can take to protect your assets. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.